Morley Winograd and Michael Hayes are going to join us today. They're co-authors of Millennial Momentum, How a New Generation is Remaking America. This is going to be published uh, this coming month from Rutgers Univers University Press, and it's their second book on the topic of millennials. It is um, looking, in, in fact, I guess, at the changes in the way uh, that millennials, well, it, it, the way millennials are going to change the way America lives and works and plays and votes. So we thought it really appropriate, and uh, again, we want to dive into uh, that topic with them. So Morley, Mike, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, we're delighted to join you. And uh, I see the presentation uh, full screen up there. And since I'm going to talk first, this is Morley Winograd. I'll introduce or turn it over to Mike as we get into some of the data. Um, uh, but we're, uh, we're delighted to have this opportunity to share with some of our friends and friends of Innovaro to uh, of the work that uh, is just about to hit the, the bookstores, if there are any left, by the time the book uh, gets published. Um, we want to talk a little bit, to, I want to talk a little bit today about setting the context of the millennials, both in terms of where they fit in generational theory and a little bit about their fundamental demographics, and then Mike's going to turn to the specifics of millennials and the future of American families. Uh, millennials will increasingly uh, dominate the adult population of America, as uh, uh, earlier presenters have already said. One out of five adults are millennials today. In just two years, they're going to be one out of four as more and more of the generation uh, turns 18. And by the end of this decade, more than one out of every three adults will be millennials. That means that the millennial lifestyles, their beliefs and behaviors, will become sort of the American lifestyle, will take over because of their dominant position in the adult uh, population, uh, the way we um, work and live, as, uh, as the introduction indicated. So let's, uh, let's just take a very short moment to put this millennial um, powerhouse in the context of uh, generational theory. And the reason we want to do that is because if you're going to predict the future, Mike and I believe that one of the most powerful uh, prisms with which to look into that future is through generational change and the way that uh, uh, Neil Howe and William Strauss first identified these generational cycles in their book, Generations. Uh, they defined and we defined the aggregate of all people born over about 20 years as a generation to the degree that they share a common location in history have common beliefs and behaviors, and believe themselves to be part of a generation. So millennials think of themselves as millennials. Boomers think of themselves as boomers. Now, why is this uh, theory even true? Uh, we are not talking about, after all, astrology. We do not believe that where and when you were born determines your life's future or daily events. But this uh, difference in attitudes and beliefs is clearly registered in social uh, science uh, surveys and uh, other research. So there's clear statistical evidence that there are generational distinctions. And the question then becomes, why do these generational distinctions exist? Uh, uh, Strauss and Howe postulate that the differences are caused by changes in the way a generation is raised and the events that people experience during maturation. Mike and I added in our first book a third influence, major influence, on how generations think and behave, and that's the changes in communication technology, starting from the uh, broadcast radio and television experiences of the 20th century to a completely different communication technology uh, architecture in terms of social networks in this century. Um, but uh, on the child rearing and events experience portions of the rationale, and the, and the reasons for this generational change. It's important to know that there is real uh, scientific uh, uh, research that demonstrates that people in their, in between ages 17 and 25, begin to take into account not only what their parents have told them and the, and the um, events that they've experienced, these two bullet points, in order to form a, uh, paradigm or perspective on how the world works that is formed between the ages of 17 and 25 and then does not change, and that's the important point, does not change during their lifetime. So you do get uh, a, a set of beliefs and behaviors that are something you can rely upon 
in working towards the future because once set, people tend to continue to take in information that validates their paradigm and disregard the rest, as uh, uh, Simon and Garfunkel's song says. So there are four generational archetypes that cycle through history. I'm going to go through them very briefly just so that you understand how millennials fit, and then we can get them to the data on millennials. We put up a couple that are not of much interest anymore. Most of the GI generation is gone, unfortunately, and the adaptive generation, of which I'm a part of, has mostly retired, except for people like the Vice President of the United States and so forth. But uh, silent generation uh, uh, is of a type called adaptive, and that's important because the Generation Z that's been referred to here will be the next, as soon as we come up with a name for that, better name for that generation, come the next adaptive generation. It's, it's archetypical name, adaptive, is a great indicator of, of the kind of personality and belief system that they bring uh, uh, to America. The civic generation, we'll talk about uh, when we get to millennials, which are part of that type archetype. But currently, the country is being run by boomers for ill or good. You can make your own judgment about their unwillingness to compromise on fundamental questions of right and wrong and how strongly that's influencing the events in Washington these days. But they uh, are a group that grows up and is taught by their parents to pursue their ideals, to trust their instincts and their feelings, uh, you know, uh, be who you are kind of uh, 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 generational instructions. And therefore, they are, can't compromise on fundamental questions of right and wrong because to do so would be to compromise their values, something that no one is comfortable doing. If they all agreed on uh, what, they, what their values are and how the world works, we'd be in great shape. But unfortunately, half of this generation believes one thing, and the other half strongly believes exactly the opposite. And so that's how we come to the kinds of difficulties we currently have in, the, in our public debate anyway these days. Certainly true in the uh, cultural wars of 40 years running. Um, the uh, next generation that follows an idealist generation is a generation that reacts and therefore called reactive against sort of uh, the conflict and continuous drama that idealist generations have brought to American history and there have been three or four idealist generations now in American history. Uh, they reactives react their generation X today. They react against what came before. They very cynical and anti-institutional uh, young people. They generally aren't raised in a very loving way. They're usually raised to learn how to get along on their own, and they take those lessons and absorb them and become terrific entrepreneurial risk takers in midlife, and we see that now in Gen X, Silicon Valley leadership, and so forth. This is the entrepreneurial spirit source of in America. And then that uh, sort of anti-institutional attitude is the opposite of what civic generations then bring to American history. Uh, civic generations, like millennials, are unified in their beliefs. Two out of every three millennials voted for President Obama. They knew that was the right answer, just as they know what every consensus decision is on their Facebook or social network page. Because they are so nurtured and loving and so central to, to life, as the earlier commentators have suggested, they grow up very optimistic and upbeat and very oriented to the group. And, of course, they, uh, they like their uh, GI generation counterparts and earlier, the Republican generation that gave us the Constitution of the United States. That was another civic generation. They build new institutions. In this case, though, they'll be building new institutions using social network technology which will make institutional life in America radically different, much more bottom-up focus. One of the reasons that millennials are important in the American life is their sheer numbers, and we've talked about that. Uh, the other is, of course, their unified beliefs. The sheer numbers are portrayed on this chart in terms of birth rate. It should be noted, however, of course, that some of that birth rate distinction is ameliorated by immigration. Gen Xers are the great immigration generation. Gener immigration is a bit on the decline now uh, amongst millennials in terms of proportion of the overall population of the generation because, as we've talked about, now a lot of that growth is coming from birth rates here in the United States. But nevertheless, there are these uh, large numerical distinctions. Uh, generation Z, if we want to give it that name, you can see at the edge of this chart is declining ever since the Great Recession took hold and economics uh, caused many people to postpone birth. 
Uh, but their numbers and their unified nature will make a major impact on America. So, too, will their diversity. Uh, you can see, I think, easily because of the way the chart has been uh, colored in, uh, the increasing diversity starting with the, year, uh, the, the last year's birth of millennials is on the very far left. The uh, oldest uh, silence and Gen Xers are on the far right. And uh, now as it approached 50% for millennials, the next generation is actually, as pointed out here, uh, getting closer to the actual 50%. But um, millennials uh, uh, are the most diverse generation in American history. Forty percent of them are non-white. Twenty-five percent of them have an uh, immigrant parent. And that's a very important part of the attitudes and beliefs of this generation. As a result, you get a generation which is decidedly not Gen X. So you have to be careful not to make that confusion between age and generations. Young people... Uh, are not all the same. They believe quite differently depending upon which generation they're in. And this pictorial representation of the dark, alienated, unsmiling Gen Xers from Time Magazine in 1990 compared to the smiling, brightly colored, hugging and loving and smiling uh, millennial generation is the best way to keep that in your head, that one is not the same as the other. There are seven traits of millennials that have been identified by Strauss and Howe from the way they were raised. They were always told they're special, and to the degree that you can convince them that you believe they're special, you'll do great with marketing to them. Uh, that specialness required them to be sheltered from life's vicissitudes, requiring play dates and organized play, never left without adult supervision. But by telling them constantly that they did a nice job as they were being raised and, uh, and um, doing nothing to, to downgrade their self-esteem, it created a very optimistic generation which if they were ever not confident, certainly became confident after they saw what they were able to do with America in the 2008 election. Their children's programming, such as Barney, taught them to play well as team members and, um, and make sure the group uh, reaches win-win solutions. So us versus them competition is kind of a boomer extra thing. It's not the kind of competition that millennials enjoy. They, do, they enjoy doing their very best, getting up to the next level in the video game, if you will, uh, because they want to demonstrate that they are capable of achievement, but not at the expense of others. All of this has created a very pressured uh, and risk-avoiding kind of generation. Uh, anything that suggests to them that it's a risky thing to do will not be something that they'll be interested in, in uh, pursuing. But it also produced a conventional, not in the sense of ideology, but in social behavior, a uh, generation that's more comfortable with their parents' values than any other recent generation. You can, they will argue and negotiate social rules, but they will nevertheless always agree that rules are important. So that's a little bit about the millennials, how they were raised, the communication technology influences. We haven't talked about the uh, current events that so impacted them, but they're fairly obvious to everybody from 9-11 to the Great Recession on the call. And I want to now turn this over to my colleague, Michael Hayes, uh, for him to give you some of the specifics as to how all this impacts millennials as over the next decade they begin to form American families. 